Plus, plus. Uh, we were speaking yesterday about the different flow meters, and um, there was the point came up about uh, we were discussing particularly the orifice flow meters and looking at vapor being formed just at that point of the pressure drop in the orifice flow meter. And then we were discussing the alternative uh, for uh, so thermal mass flow meters on the short end, what both of you were talking about in the past. I never heard of them, and actually, the principle behind them is quite interesting. Uh, if, you, if you're not aware of it, uh, well, let's just take a look quickly. They're used primarily for gas flow uh, measurements, and I thought I'd, I'd just talk about the principle behind it because it's actually really interesting um, and has a number of advantages. So the principle is to put in two thermal couples into the line. One we call T net, and the other one T. And this particular one is so there's some electrical energy provided to that. And as the and there's a known surface area, there's a known geometry of this metal plate that's heated. As this flow in the pipe changes, we have a reference temperature. We can measure then the resulting temperature on that thermal uh, couple, the second one that's being heated. And the amount of electrical energy that's added to the system then is going to be proportional to the flow. So the conduction um, of that of uh, that of that metal surface will remove the heat proportional to the flow. So through, through the, the mathematical calculations and the known uh, properties of that material, we can quickly calculate the flow. The nice thing about this, though it might be more expensive than other thermal couples, is that there's no moving parts. Uh, which, for example, with some of the turbine flow meters, there's a moving part here, there's no moving parts. Um, it's insensitive to temperature and pressure fluctuations, only to be calibrated, because it's got its own internal calibration against the reference temperature. All you're concerned about is the delta T that it gets set up there. So, overall, this, this uh, type of measurement has a number of um, advantages. Of the main area of use of is primarily gas. It doesn't work well in liquid systems. So gas flow systems is sort of tremendous. Okay, so I thought I'd just quickly talk about that before the class started. Uh, the other thing just to mention is we are going around and I expect that you probably have received it. Uh, this is the time of year where the School of Engineering practice and the uh, the parents department wants you all to do masters and PhDs, so they're trying to get back to you. <laughs> so let's talk, uh, Dr. Schwartz is an info session on Tuesday, uh, 13th of November. And they're going to lure you with free pizza and free food. Okay, so that's an <laughs> okay, so that's an opportunity for you to ask questions about your graduate school. Um, talk about what what are the options for funding. There's a there's good funding for grad students if you're doing masters or PhD. Uh, you can get most of your uh, tuition paid for. Uh, career paths and options. But this one, I mean, in all seriousness, yes, they are trying to advertise this and and uh, but. At the end of the day, it's an economic evaluation. If you want to see it in pure dollar terms, um, you can go go back and look at what, what that means monetarily. Those are two years that you're not working, or four years, five years if you're doing a PhD. Uh, what does it mean in terms of economics for you? Um, we've, we've looked at that in this class already on a few occasions. And there's actually there was another Global Mail article uh, recently talking about um, the economic benefits of, of the university, and so I'll post that once the website is online. And to do this. Okay, so so those are just two things before we get started. And the final thing, um, two other things is I've posted a link to the course website on various flow measurement alternatives. So so that's there's a website that Dr. Marlon has set up, and I'll link to that. And then the last thing is I will post an update SQL below. Today, that talks a bit more about the, the expectations for that report. Also, on just some timing issues, I was talking to the floor in class this morning about it. This is a time of year, obviously, that's tremendously stressful for, for you. Um, and the instructors recognize that, not to a greater or lesser extent. Um, but I definitely recognize that you guys are heavily loaded with other projects in the other courses. So, uh, 
on that, there is no tutorial on Monday. So that two hour period that you have free, I would let you choose what you want to do with it, but obviously one good way to spend that time is to work on the SDO projects. Uh, classes next week, there will be classes next week, at least on the Tuesday and Thursday. I'm not sure about the Friday yet. I do need the Tuesday and Thursday class to cover some important material that is for the tutorial the following week. Now the tutorial the following week, so next week there's no tutorial, the week after that there is a tutorial. That's not a group tutorial. You're going to be rearranged into groups of three and working with someone who you've never worked with before and you're going to be troubleshooting a lot. And you have 25 minutes to do it and then you alternate between the the, the triplets. So that tutorial session will be about 30 minutes per person times three, so it's an hour and a half. Um, and the hand in is at the tutorial. So you troubleshoot the process, you hand it in, and, and you're done with it. So we're going to learn how to troubleshoot processes in a methodical manner next week in class, and then we're going to apply in the tutorial week after. So that will be the last tutorial for this course. Um, and then you're into SDL projects and presentations and items for that. So this course is not too much left in terms of your workload, um, but I do caution you to manage your time well for your SDL projects so that that doesn't take a back seat uh, with respect to your other, other work. Okay. So any questions on, on hand-ins and timing and so on? So let's take a look then at this topic. This is flexibility. This is on page 42 of your printed notes if you're looking for it. And essentially what we're going to look at is the principle, last time we, last class we were looking at steady state operation of the process and establishing operating unit. Now we're talking a bit about dynamic responses and we're going to find out can we tell how our plant will handle disturbances. Okay, so essentially we want to achieve our set points, and we want to be able to compensate for the disturbances. This is the same idea of steering a car. So driving a car is a perfect example of feed forward and feedback control. So you've got feed forward control based on what's coming up ahead of you on the road. There's disturbances and you're compensating for that. And feedback control as well. So you've got the, your gas pedal, creating acceleration and, and achieving a certain speed to manipulate a variable to achieve a certain desired set point, which is exactly what cruise control is in the way, or your foot and eye and uh, looking at the speed on the speedometer. So we want to do the same with our chemical processes. We need to steer the process. The topics in today's class heavily um, require the concepts from 3P. We're going to look at, at multivariate input-output systems and we have to understand those uh, to understand this section. So flexibility and controllability is our ability to adjust the process after the equipment's been designed. So we spoke a bit about that yesterday as well, in fact. Uh, there's, we put in spare capacity, spare pumps in parallel or in series. Um, heat exchangers, we're going to look at sequences of heat exchangers and how they will interact with each other. Um, we put in high classes in our piping. And all of this is done with the, with the goal of making sure our process essentially has a greater operating window than it would otherwise have. That's what we covered yesterday. And also, that same, doing that same thing of putting pumps in parallel and series, adding bypasses, will give us some additional flexibility in our process. And in fact, that's a common theme in this whole operability chapter, is that one change we make to improve flexibility often improves our ability to start up and shut down the process. So usually, the same change achieves multiple objectives. And that's great. Um, it means that there's a finite number of things we need to learn in order to get a flexible and controllable process with a large operating window. We seldom ever see these conflict with each other. One change will often achieve multiple objectives. So we're going to look at a number of case studies again. It's by case study in today's class. So here, let's take this case. We've got a distillation column, and we've got a nominal point of operation. So what do we mean by an operating point? It's a combination of values that tell us where our process is. So what is my current feed flow rate? What is the pressure at a, at a particular point in the column? Usually in the top 
part of the column is where we're interested in controlling the pressure. What are the levels? Say in my condensing drum and in my reboiler area down here at the bottom. The composition leaving the distillate and the composition leaving the plugs. All of those will give us an uh, operating point. And we're, we're comfortable with that concept from Aspen and Hysis if you've used those simulators. There's a finite number of things that you need to specify before everything is fully specified and you can go ahead. So the same idea, we need, to, we need to give a certain amount of information to define where our process is currently operating. But we're going to have some uncertainty and some disturbances. We have spoke about these in the earlier classes. We're uncertain about what our heat transfer capacities are, uh, liquid vapor equilibrium con uh, constants. Our disturbances are coming in from our feed and from ambient conditions. So our feed temperature and our feed rate, our feed composition is varying during time. And our cooling water is varying, our reef water temperature is varying. We've, we've, we're comfortable with the fact that we got this variability coming into the process. The question now is, what can we do to compensate for it? And if we want our process to operate at a particular desired point, we know that we want a given feed rate to the column. That comes from our production criteria. We've, people in our company have said, we need to process this amount of fuel through the through distillation column in order to meet our sales criteria by the end of the week. Pressure and levels, these may come from economic optimum. If I operate at a certain pressure, I'm getting a desired distillate composition, and that's more economically desirable than an alternative. So all of these points are set. How can we achieve those despite this uncertainty and despite these disturbances? What do I add to that column? What do I add to that diagram that you see over there to achieve that? when those disturbances come in. <coughs> we've, got, we've learned this from, from 3P, from our feedback control. I want to achieve those certain feed flow rates. I want to achieve a certain desired pressure in my column. What do I need to add to my motion as, as shown here to, to get that? Uh, in my control valve. In my control valve, so okay. over here. Anything else? And how would I control the level in my condenser? How would I control the pressure in, in the top of my tower? Heat input into the reboiler will affect composition down here. Heat input into my condenser up there will affect pressure. So I, I, what I essentially am aiming for is to add a number of control valves to my process. How many do I add and where do I add them? That's the part that we're, we're trying to understand. So it's, it's one thing to recognize that we need to add control valves. We definitely will. But, for example, if I wanted to control my reflux ratio, how much distillate I return back to the column versus how much I take off. This is the ratio of the split over here. Where do I add valve or valves to it? To the <coughs> do I add one out here? Would a valve out there help me achieve my, my reflux ratio? Yes, no. Would a valve coming from this liquid pump, so I'm pumping this liquid back in, a valve along this point? No? Over here? Yeah. So there's a certain combination of valves that will work, some that won't. Uh, let's take a look. For this reflux ratio, I do need a valve coming back into the column, and because it's a ratio, I need to have two valves. A single valve over here at just after the pump is not going to be sufficient to control the reflux ratio. In terms of uh, feed manipulation, an interesting option is to add your feed, feed to different trays. So I can choose where to feed my column and that will affect compositions and the pressure and temperature profile along my column as well. So that's, that's an option we can 
can add to achieve flexibility. The feed, overall feed flow coming from the pump, my, my reboiler duty, my condenser duty, and then the outlet, my bottom composition. So as I open that up more, I'm letting more material out, but it's recycling it back or full effect composition. So I can achieve that <coughs> goals. Let's just go back again for my operating point, those five conditions that I wish to achieve, I can achieve by adding a number of manipulated variables to my process. So we're, we're used to, from your 3P course, we've learned that we need a certain number of, if I've got a certain number of manipulated variables, sorry, if I've got a certain number of variables I desire to control, I need at least as many manipulated variables. So if I've got three outputs I wish to control, I'm going to need at least three inputs to manipulate. Um, I'm going to change the slides to the next one. Don't worry, I will post these to the course website, so you can always update your notes. With these. Um, I know that you don't have this added on to your version, so this this will come. So we call this concept the degrees of freedom. Here's a process with a number of outputs: um, the pressure leaving the column that I would like to control. There's the level that I'm controlling over here. There's all sorts of flows and temperatures in that. The reactor. The principle, the general principle here is that the number of variables that I wish to achieve, I need to have the number of valves at least equal or exceeding that. Okay, it's not a guarantee, however, that I will be able to achieve that control. But at a minimum, I do require that. If I have fewer degrees of freedom to adjust, I'm not able to achieve that on the market. And if I meet that criteria, however, it is no guarantee that I'll be successful to achieve my goal. And we'll see some of that coming in the examples today. But it is a minimum, a minimum requirement. Okay, so what we're going to learn here is actually just a recap of, of, of 3P's uh, multi input, multi output section. So we need these relationships between our adjusted and our control variable. And the key is that it must be a causal relationship. If I change my manipulated variable, it's a no good having that as my manipulated variable if it doesn't affect my output variable. So it must have a causal relationship there. But we remember that we're going to see interaction when we have multi input, multi output systems. So let's quickly recap what interaction is. So two drivers, they're trying to achieve different goals, independent positions. Okay, so they can go independently of each other. There's no interaction between driver A and B, or green and blue here. If there's interaction in the system, we can consider them to be combined with some sort of spring. So if I change one, the green car moves forward, it's going to pull the blue car with it. Okay, so there's some interaction between those two systems. That's, um, that's clear. And then there's the extreme case of that is when they're completely linked. So if they were connected by a steel beam, for example, then when one changes, the other changes by the exact same amount or some proportion to it. Okay, so, so this is the ideal case where we're able to manipulate our variables independent of each other. If I want to achieve composition at the top of my column, it would be great if I could do that without affecting the composition at the bottom of my column. But in practice, that's not possible. If we change one, it inevitably after some time, the other will end up changing as well. And so we can almost, uh, and for many practical cases, we have interaction. There's some cases where we do have no interaction. Those are great because we can design the control loops for them independent of each other. But the moment we have interaction, we need to take a more careful look at how we design that control system. And then this particular case is when they're linked, essentially if we're controlling one, we're automatically controlling the other. Okay, so it's not possible to try and make the blue car there go twice as fast as the green car for, for a period of time. So when they're linked like that, uh, we recognize that controlling one automatically controls the other. So they, they're linear dependent in those cases. So let's take a look at, at how we can quantify that. This um, may or may not be something that you looked at in, in 3P, so let's, let's uh, quickly re, uh, learn about this. 
if we've got, in this case, two variables that I wish to control, control variable one and two, and I've got manipulated variable one and manipulated variable two. The gains in those matrices here refer to the steady state gain. So we're not considering the dynamics, we're only considering the gain. If I make it, let's say K11 is a, is a positive number, if I make an increase in manipulated variable one multiplied by K11 plus K12 multiplied by the change in manipulated variable two. Let's consider for a moment K12 to be zero. If K11 is non-zero multiplied by a change in my first manipulated variable, I will see a change in my control variable. So these are deviation variables. If K12 is non-zero, then I must consider manipulated variable 2's current effect on 2CV1 as well. So I can't manipulate variable 1 independent of manipulated variable 2. My change that I make in manipulated variable 1 must be aware of what manipulated variable 2 is also at. And then the result of that is going to get the control variable 1. So if I call my system controllable, there's a mathematical rule that we can, we can derive that says my system is controllable as long as this matrix of gains, so these are just single numbers over here. These are not transfer functions. These are just your gains. So as long as those gains in that matrix if I calculate the determinant of it and it's, it's non-zero, then I can invert that matrix and I can call my system control. The crudest example was if this entire matrix was zeros, then my system is clearly not controllable. No matter what I do to manipulate variable one or manipulate variable two, if this matrix is all zeros, I'm not going to see any change in my control variable. So that's a that's a, a, a trivial example of a zero determinant. We're going to see a, 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 a different example coming up next. So recall the determinant is a measure of linear independence in the system, and we said earlier that if we've got linear dependent systems, we've got that case. So we can already start to imagine what happens in a system where I've got linear dependence, I'm not going to be able to be controlled. The determinant of K, the determinant of the matrix is a measure of linear dependence. So let's take a look at, at, at an example here. Mm -hmm. This one is um, a case where I wish to achieve two goals. I wish to achieve the, the flow of my outlet and the composition of it. So two control variables. And I'm going to adjust the flow of stream A. So there's some sort of uh, species in the stream, species A, and it's got composition X subscript A. So this first stream, I'm going to manipulate the flow with this well. The second stream contains no A. Let's call this a, a solvent stream, for example. So this is a solvent coming in at a different flow rate, Fs. In composition, of A is zero, there's no A in that stream. I wish to control, however, the blend of that, so what is my blended flow and my blended composition? What would be that matrix, the transfer function matrix of gains look like? So what would this <coughs> matrix look like? Here to the right. What would be what would you consider at least in that in the derivation? Right, so we're going to let's take a look at that matrix. So we might this way. We're going to look at control FM that flow out and then the composition XAM. So those are my two control variables, and I'm going to control. What I'm looking for is manipulating the flow of A and manipulating the flow of the solvent S. Any values in that transfer function matrix be zero? The gains, sure. Um, I was thinking because the XAS is less than yes, you would have your one of your, the bottom right of the user. 
and you might get to say, I think I don't know. Yeah, let's think about it. So, firstly, what would be the effect of A, like, manipulate A would be effective on FMB at steady state. If I open FA, FM is going to go up. So, we're going to get a positive number over here. If I open FS, I'm going to increase Fn as well. So both of those are going to be greater than zero. If I open Fa, what is the composition of, of Xam going to, to do? Increase as well. If I open Fs, what is the composition of Xam going to increase? Okay, so at the very minimum, we can at least determine our size. If we wanted to spend a bit more time on it, we could do our mass balance and our composition balance and determine that Fm in deviation form is Fa plus Fs in deviation form. So that's my overall mass balance. I uh, don't write this down because it's going to be, there's not going to be time to do it. The main thing here to recognize is that if I open Fa, yes, Xam is going to increase this constant out here is my, if you did the calculation in deviation form, is the flow rate of solvent divided by the flow of solvent plus A squared. So every one of these are positive quantities in one positive term. If I open Fs, we correctly said that the sign of that gain is going to be negative, and we see that coming through the transfer function at steady state as well. So if I substitute these four quantities, so the, the constant in front of f dash a is 1, the constant in front of f dash s is 1, so I'm going to substitute a 1 in over here at each one of those positions. By substituting those terms here, I would get fs divided by fs plus fa squared, and this would be fa negative divided by fs plus fa squared. So that would be my, my, matrix, my gain matrix capital K. And if I calculate the determinant of, determinant of that, I can determine it's non-zero. So always these terms, F, A, and Fs are positive numbers, so that overall that determinant is always going to be non-zero. So this system is controllable, but there is interaction. I cannot independently move the bell position for stream A. I have to take the current bell position of stream B into account as well. So this is what we mean by controllability. We can't, we, um, there's going to be interaction in the system between those two manipulated variables and those two controlled variables. Let's uh, take a look at another example here. Here's a non-isothermal reaction system where we've got a valve manipulating the feed entering. So feed flow into the tank. The second manipulated variable is my flow of cooling to the tank. There's a reaction occurring, whether it's releasing heat or, um, or, or taking heat up, doesn't matter too much. Um, but let's assume it's exothermic. We're taking A and producing products B plus 2 C. Now, if, my, if I desired to manipulate my flow coming in and this heating or cooling I'm providing to my tank, if it's exothermic, I'm just providing cooling. So I'm manipulating the rate of cooling and my rate of flow. Those are my two manipulated groups. If my choice of controlled variables was the concentration of D and the concentration of C. So I wish to make my manipulated variables, let's call it flow, and my other variable two that I'm manipulating is the duty or the, uh, the amount of cooling. And my inlets, uh, sorry, my, my desired control variables with a concentration of B and a concentration of C. Controllable, not controllable. Before, before we do any other mathematical analysis in there, what, what is your your gut feel? Up. 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 Up.
goes on. Uh, I don't think that the vaccine concentration. You don't think that UV will affect the concentration? Um, so let's take a look. If I increase my UV by animal cooling, I'm going to reduce the, um, the oh, sorry, animal cooling, I'm going to reduce the temperature of the tank. If I reduce the temperature of the tank, my rate constant changes. My rate constant changes whether the forward and backwards uh, will, will change. So UV will affect concentrations. Feed flow, feed flow effect concentrations. Right, so as I add more of A, I should get more of B and C coming up. So we've got, we expect non-zero entries in our gain matrix. So I expect my feed flow will adjust CB, my feed flow will adjust CC, my duty will adjust both of them. So non-zero is in the four position. So that's the given. Controllable or not controllable? So here the issue is that C, the concentration of C, is always double that of B. I'm producing B in one mole, I'm producing two of C. So there's, there's a, a lack of linear uh, independence in here where we say the systems are dependent. Um, whatever my gain is that I calculate in the first row for the manipulated variable one and manipulated variable two, whatever the effect of flow is on CB and whatever the effect of Q is on CB, the effect on CC is just going to be double that because the concentrations are always double that. So in this case, we're driving a set of cars that are connected by a solid B. If A goes, uh, sorry, B goes up, C goes up by twice that. So it's a dependent system. It's not controllable. My choice of CB to control CB is not sensible to choose to control CB and CC. But if you think of it just in that terms, the system is producing this reaction, I could, shouldn't be able to control B independent of C. If I'm controlling B, I'm effectively controlling C. But let's ask a different question. If I wanted to control, let's say, okay, I realize that now, I've become a little smarter, so I've decided, okay, I'm not going to control CC. Let me rather control temperature at the outlet. Well, the flow rate F, we've established that the flow rate F will affect CB. Will the flow rate F of my incoming stream here affect the temperature at the outlet? So if I add more feed material, I'm going to um, add or change the heat capacity in the tank. So that's going to adjust. So, temp so, so concentration and temperature will both be manipulated by the feed and the duty. So I'm going to get a set of, of non-zero constants in that matrix, so four non-zero constants. And this, if you, if you work through the mathematics of it, it's a non-linear derivation that you then linearize and, and do all the fast transforms on it. You will get a set of four Ks, and you'll end up with a system that's interactive. So I cannot control the concentration independent of the temperature. That also makes intuitive sense. If I increase the temperature in my tank, my concentration of B is going to go down. Um, so I'm moving my rate constant around. So, or, or, or sorry, concentration of B will go up, but depending if it's an endo or exothermic reaction. So B's concentration cannot be adjusted without temperature and vice versa. So it's an interacting system, as we had before. So this, uh, this just gives you an idea of what controllability is about, so we understand that. Okay, let's look at uh, let's look at uh, some other examples. Then, if I'm looking at controlling, I've, I've just uh, the notes that you have that slightly different terminology. Made it made a little clearer. We want to maintain stream A's effluent. So here's stream A coming in as cold. It's effluent on the other side of the heat exchanger. That temperature T over there. I wish to maintain that temperature at the desired value T. So one manipulated, one controlled variable. At a minimum, we need a single manipulated variable. So we always need one, one manipulated variable. So let's consider different combinations. What if I keep stream A's flow rate constant? So 
that's not a manipulated variable, but then we rather manipulate stream B's flows. So this is the usual one that we see. I've got my, my process stream coming here to a certain temperature that I desire at the outlet. I'm going to manipulate the flow of stream B here. So stream B could be a utility such as steam. That's, that's one that we've seen before. But now let's also consider, that's not the only manipulated variable we could pick. There's some others that we could use. We could say, well, what if stream B is constant and then the flow of the stream I'm trying to control the temperature for? So this seems a little unusual. I'm trying to control this stream's temperature by manipulating its flow. Um, what, what would that look like? And then could we consider this case here? We have got two constants. I, I'm not able to manipulate the flow of A or of B. This happens quite frequently. When we do energy integration on a flow sheet, stream A is maybe the stream going to my distillation column, and stream B is some other stream from my process, but I'm not able to manipulate its flow. I, I know that it's a hot stream available to use, but I'm not able to manipulate its flow rate, because if I do that, I'm going to disturb a, a, another part upstream or downstream of the flow sheet. So I'm not able to manipulate the flow of either stream, but can we still control that temperature over the water? Okay, so let's take a look at the first option. What would that flow sheet look like? If you're manipulating only the stream B's flow to achieve temperature, this is the one that we've seen before. Okay, so we're, we're comfortable with that one. But let's take a look at the second case. I could conceivably do this. There's nothing <coughs> stopping me from manipulating this flow upstream of A to adjust the temperature. But as we've said here, it's not typical to do this. Right? It's, um, it will work, but usually if the temperature of that stream is important, the flow is often also important. You can't um, go adjust one without the other, without thinking of the other. Usually the flow and the temperature of those streams are, are important. And then the last case that's, uh, that's quite interesting is we can actually achieve um, control of that outlet temperature without manipulating either flow. So I'm not changing the flow of A and I'm not changing the flow of B, but by using an interesting bypass setup over there, I bypass the amount of flow needed to control that bypass flow rate to achieve that temperature. So that's an interesting alternative option. And the other nice thing about that final setup is the fast dynamics. Very, very rapid dynamics. We've looked at dynamics a bit in the tutorial on Monday. We spoke about heat exchanges and steam and condensate and, and different dynamics if you're going in different directions. Here, they're very, very rapid dynamics because you don't have to wait for a change in flow over here. If I have to manipulate this flow of stream B coming in, there's a while before that change actually takes effect on the temperature. So there's a time delay and there's maybe first order or second order dynamics that, that kick in. But bypass is incredibly fast. I open that valve, I'll immediately see a change in flow and then I've got mixing which is instantaneous at that point of impingement. So very, very rapid dynamics to control temperature while still maintaining constant flows. The only thing you now have to think of here which is, that is how am I going to start up and shut down the process? Okay, so if stream B comes from downstream, let's, see, let's say this goes into a reactor, which is over here, and stream B is the outlet of the reactor that's coming back in to heat up. How am I going to turn this process on for the very first time to we start? Up? So we'll talk about, about that in the next class. Some interesting things you can do to start up the process. So energy integration saves us a lot of money. We have to though be careful on how we control an instrument and also think about startup and shutdown. Okay, so that's that's a nice uh, a nice illustration of that. <coughs> Can we do this? So I've got stream A. Again, these are these are utility. Oh, sorry, it's not a utility stream. This is a stream that I wish to heat up, and stream B is a stream I wish to cool down. Neither of which are utilities. So utilities are great because we can mess them around at any temperature and flow we like. My steam, if I return it back as condensate or as partial condensate, it doesn't matter. I know my steam regeneration plant's going to take care of that disturbance. But these are two streams that I cannot adjust 
the flow is full, and I wish to get the temperatures both to desired points. Okay, so in this case, if I I won't go through too much of the details, um, but they're in your notes there. <coughs> Essentially, we do that energy balance across the, the cold stream being heated and then stream B. We have to equate those, those heats, the heats going from one side to the other. Essentially, we have a perfectly coupled system, the same as we saw before, um, where you essentially, if you're changing one, the other is going to immediately change as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a, a, a lack, we've got lack of independence. So it makes somewhat intuitive sense. If I'm manipulating this temperature, that flow over here, it's going to affect that temperature, but it's also going to affect that temperature. They're going to go in a step with each other through the energy balance. But that's still unsatisfying because we often want to achieve that sort of goal. Uh, Let's take a look at, at this case where I'm going to cross the street that I'm aiming to heat up. And one, I've got a, a, a stream from my process over here that does somewhat of a job, but it doesn't heat it up to the required temperature. <coughs> and I've got several such streams available. This is very common in large integrated refineries, where you've got multiple streams available, and each of them have some heat left over before they go to storage or before they go to other steps. And we exchange heat with them in a, in a sequence of heat exchanges. But none of these streams, one, two, three, or four, can be manipulated. Their flow rates cannot be manipulated. They just they come from other parts of the process, and we don't want to adjust those flows. What sort of disturbances can occur to this overall control system? If we're considering disturbances, only. We'll talk about set points next, but what disturbances can happen? So talk about it with the person just next to you. What disturbances come into that system over there to uh, that, that change where that final temperature is going to be? upstream or downstream are operating. There's also a disturbance in the temperature of my feed coming in. So if this feed comes in lower, I'm going to need greater greater amounts of heat transfer at those subsequent yes. And then there might be set point changes called for periodically in my final temperature over there. So depending on, on, on all of these, I need to be able to have a system that can handle it. What way can I add flexibility to this overall flow sheet to achieve that. Well, so there's not enough time, really too much to, to think about it first. So I'll just show, show one, one particular is again adding a bypass around just that final heat exchanger. Um, so we're using these, these streams up here to get most of our heat requirements. And in the final heat exchanger, we can bypass around it to get just the balance of heat required. 
So that will, it, that will allow us to achieve the set points called for periodically in this outlet temperature. And opening and closing this valve will also allow us to compensate for differing temperatures and inlet flows coming from those, from those streams that we were exchanging. Okay, so both, both of those goals of disturbance rejection and set point changes can be achieved with that modification to the flow sheet. So we're starting to see a few things in common. A lot of bypasses and, and parallel uh, circuits being set up in our plants. So this is this is a common a common way that we enhance our process. Remember, we started this operability section by saying operability is, is it's something that's hard to define, but overall, what it does is it allows us to make our processes easier to operate, more almost pleasurable. So it's less of a pain in the ass to operate every day. So this gives us that flexibility and controllability to improve how we yeah. move our process around. There's a, another one here that's been added is if even these four systems in sequence don't provide the, the required heat that you need, then we have, and this you'll see in, in refineries quite a bit, is we'll add in a, a subsequent furnace. So this furnace then will provide the additional amount of heat after we've already heated it up, we then say, well, we recognize it's not going to be enough, then we need a, a final furnace to get the